All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to welcome all of you to our webinar entitled Demystifying SNAP EBT on College Campuses. Through this webinar, we would like to reduce the stigma surrounding students receiving food benefits and also highlighting that it can help alleviate student hunger by ensuring that students can buy food at campus retail stores using their SNAP benefits. We are the Center for Law and Social Policy, which is a not, which is a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization advancing policy solutions for low income people. So I want to introduce myself. Hello, everyone. My name is Parker Gilkison, and I am a policy analyst here at the Center for Law and Social Policy, and I'll be your moderator today. So today we have a wonderful group of panelists who will be discussing um, such a necessary topic. And our first panelist is Carrie Welton. Carrie Welton is a policy analyst on the Income and Work Support Team. In this role, she focuses on policy and system changes that improve access to public benefits and other basic needs support for students with low incomes and students from communities of color. Carrie's work is greatly informed by her own experiences as a single student parent and the barriers she faced trying to go to school while working and caring for her son. Our second panelist is Yesenia, Yesenia Jimenez, and Yesenia is a current Immersion National Hunger Fellow serving with the class and also um, she previously worked with the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute and in February released her report titled Strategies to Reduce Hunger on Massachusetts Campuses, SNAP EBT Access on Public College Campuses. Yesenia started working on student hunger issues while at the University of California, Davis, and testified about her personal lived experience with food and housing insecurity at the U.S. Senate briefing, Hunger in College, Food Insecurity on American Campuses. Our final panelist is David Nakamura. David is the executive director at Humboldt State University's University Center. He has been instrumental in establishing SNAP EBT at HSU and many other campuses in and outside California. With his leadership, HSU became the first college campus in California to establish EBT on campus. David is also a key partner in the California State University Basic Needs Cross Campus Network, where he helps advocate for a more equitable, equitable higher education system. So here's the agenda that we will be discussing today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the question chat box, and we will answer as many questions as we can during the question and answer portion of the webinar. After the question and answer portion, we will post a list of resources that you can refer to for more information. So first up is our panelist, Carrie Welton. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. So I'm going to talk about the basic guidelines for understanding SNAP for students and then a couple of issues surrounding that to sort of set the context for the EBT conversation. So what we really have is a variety of challenges over the last couple of decades that have made post-secondary education harder for traditionally underrepresented groups, such as people of color, students with low income, students who are parenting, first generation, and immigrant students. Um, we know that post-secondary education is more important than ever now that many jobs require post-secondary credentials to achieve a livable wage. And we see this reflected in information that shows that um, a student's chance of enrolling in college used to rise consistency, consistently with family income, but now we see low-income students enrolling at rates higher than their middle-income peers. This country has also done a very good job of stigmatizing public benefits use and um, mistrust among low-income people that have resulted in barriers in uh, accessing public benefits. Um, part of this has included negative perceptions about poor people, as well as a strong association between welfare and race that have played a major role in attitudes towards the welfare system and in the public policy choices and public benefit programs. These attitudes have weakened public benefit programs over time and limited their ability to help people generally, including students. The policy choices discourage education and emphasize work first, 
even if it is low wage, low growth work, which creates a poverty trap for people with low incomes who are trying to achieve economic security through education. We also know that people of color face worse outcomes across a variety of indicators due to systemic and individual racism. This has taken many forms, but include employment discrimination, over-policing, um, mortgage and insurance discrimination, and much more that have all harmed the ability of communities of color to build wealth and own homes at the same levels as white families. This is particularly important because we know that uh, child outcomes are strongly correlated with family income, but these systemic factors have negatively impacted intergenerational mobility for families of color that include higher education and created disproportionate outcomes. We're also dealing with a higher education system that has been geared towards the traditional view of a college student. That's usually those enrolled directly after high school and who attend full time and either don't work or work part time. Much of this structure and related culture is still in place on many campuses that create barriers for non-traditional students that include class schedules and other campus norms geared towards traditional students. We also know that a college education is much more expensive now than it used to be due to higher tuition costs and less state spending on higher education, which has shifted the burden to students and families. These converging challenges shed light on why we see such high levels of food and housing insecurity among students. This recent report from the Hope Center at Temple University shows data on basic student needs and security. It was conducted in the fall of 2018 at 123 two and four year institutions across the United States and collected responses from almost 86,000 students. Here we see the data disaggregated based on two and four year institutions, but across both, 45% of respondents were food insecure in the prior 30 days of the survey. 56 of respondents were housing insecure in the previous year, and 17% 17 17 of respondents were homeless in the previous year. Which is why at CLAST, we make this case for comprehensive student aid. You'll see that the four pillars on the left are higher education resources we traditionally think of as the financial aid system, but because we know students with low incomes do not have the same supports as those of their middle and in upper income peers, and higher levels of food and housing insecurity, we believe leveraging public benefits as the fifth pillar of student aid can help students persist and complete. I am going to walk through the SNAP eligibility for students in particular, but those of you who are interested in the rules around students and other public benefit programs, feel free to contact me after this webinar. So we know that few students are receiving SNAP. This report from the Government Accountability Office estimated that among all potentially eligible undergraduate students, 57% of them were not participating in the program, indicating high degree of opportunity for them to receive SNAP to reduce food insecurity. So I'm gonna go through some of the general SNAP requirements and then I'm gonna move into the student rules. So we know SNAP has income and asset limits. I've included a couple examples here for one person and a three person family. And then there are also asset limits that include cash savings or vehicles. And there is state variation among these income and asset limits, so these are the federal guidelines that you're seeing. There are also household qualifications that usually include people that are living and preparing food together, and this almost always includes spouses and children under the age of 22, though there are different rules for seniors. And immigration status, so most SNAP recipients have to be U.S. citizens or lawfully present non-citizens, and there are very limited circumstances which non-citizens under the age of 18 can access SNAP. And the maximum benefit amount for one person is $192, though the average is around 134. For a three-person family, the maximum benefit is $504, though the average is actually closer to 378. Now, for student eligibility, the federal rules are very clear that um, a person attending less than half time is not considered a student for the purposes of SNAP. These people may still be eligible for SNAP, but they would not qualify for a student exemption. They would follow SNAP's traditional eligibility rules. To be considered a SNAP, a, a student for SNAP's purposes, you have to be attending at least half time as def defined by the institution, and you would then qualify for a student exemption. So these student exemptions include um, receiving temporary assistance for needy families, cash assistance, or other general assistance. Under these federal guidelines, some states have maximized their ability to extend these benefits to SNAP. For example, Massachusetts allows students receiving a MASS grant 
which is funded with TANF dollars to receive SNAP under this student exemption. For those under the age of 17 or 17 or younger, age 50 or older, they meet an exemption, as well as responsible for a dependent child under the age of six. Those that are responsible for a child between the ages of six and 12 and have trouble securing childcare can receive SNAP under this exemption. And single parents who are enrolled full-time and responsible for a dependent under the age, age 12 or under can also receive SNAP under this exemption. Students who participate in a state or federally funded work-study program may receive SNAP. And California allows students who are approved for a work-study and anticipate taking a work-study job during the semester to qualify for SNAP under this exemption. If you participate in an on-the-job training program, you can qualify for SNAP as a student, and this includes programs under the SNAP Employment and Training Program. And if you're working at least 20 hours a week in paid employment, as well as being a student, you could qualify for SNAP. States also have the ability to average work across a month or a semester, and some states do take advantage of that option. And if you're in school through a state or federally improved employment and training program, you may also qualify for SNAP. In Pennsylvania, they issue guidance that clarifies that students enrolled in career and technical programs as defined by the Perkins Act qualify for SNAP through this exemption. And if a student is unable to work for health reasons, they may qualify for SNAP through this exemption. I did want to flag a couple of other eligibility criteria which come up fairly commonly. One of those is that if you're a student who is experiencing homelessness, you have special rules that you could apply for which improve your eligibility. Um, if you're attending less than, high, less than half time, you could be subject to SNAP's work requirement. And if you're receiving more than half of your meals through a campus meal plan, you would not be eligible for a SNAP benefit. You could also be eligible for SNAP if you're receiving TANF cash assistance or SSI and some other forms of general assistance. This is referred to as categorical eligibility. And I did also want to flag on the financial aid side that for a student completing a FAFSA or a family member, if you receive one of several public benefits in the previous two calendar years and you answer this in the affirmative on the FAFSA application, you could qualify for an expected family contribution of zero or a simplified needs test, which disregards that asset information. This question is typically under answered on the FAFSA because students and families believe that those benefits may count towards their income eligibility and reduce their overall aid. So when we talk about what institutions can do to engage students in SNAP eligibility, we really talk about it on a continuum of low intensity, low resource opportunities, and high intensity, high resource opportunities. I've listed a couple of here. Um, some institutions have decided to include what basic need supports are available on campus, or if students are eligible for SNAP, or that campuses have food banks in their syllabi. It can be included in award letter notifications if a student is receiving a Pell Grant or meets other income criteria that they could be eligible for SNAP. Um, including information and other supportive services across campus, such as financial aid, uh, academic counseling, and really any other opportunity to engage students that may be struggling, whether that's early warning academic opportunities um, to inform them about other basic need supports. And institutions also communicate with students through a variety of social media platforms that could promote access to public benefits and other basic need supports on campus. On the higher end of the resource, um, we talk about institutions who have paid staff navigators who help students with a variety of uh, barriers that include connecting them to basic needs. We encourage the institutions we work with to partner with their human services office and community partnerships to improve access to basic needs supports, as well as establishing a campus food bank, which is an important first step, though that will not reach all of the students you're trying to reach that have food and housing insecurity issues. Um, establishing emergency aid funds is also one of the um, opportunities that we talk to institutions about and looking at ways to survey students or collect data in new ways that better capture student basic needs to be able to target some of these resources. And obviously we're going to talk about EBT on campus and how this can foster a culture of support and engagement by leveraging public benefits to improve persistence and completion. And I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague Yesenia. Thank you, Carrie. Um, thank you to everyone for attending as well. 
Um, during this, this next portion of the webinar, I will be talking about strategies we can use to destigmatize food insecurity on college campuses. And this is a critical conversation to have as campus administrators and partners because students should feel safe when they are accessing any type of assistance on campus. And recognizing that talking about hunger and or housing insecurity is not easy. Um, and so there are various reasons why that is the case. And Carrie um, highlighted some of those points, but I would also like to briefly look at the, um, look at the stigmatizing narratives tied to poverty and hunger in the US. Um, so in the U.S., there is a misconception that people who are impacted by poverty and hunger have brought their poverty on themselves through their own laziness, inadequate skills, individual or even culturally inherited deficiencies, etc. And often these false characteristics are directly linked to harsh treatment for people impacted by poverty and hunger. Um, so as we think about strategies to end hunger among our student population, it's important that we also look closely at the root causes of hunger and poverty. And this will help campuses as they develop strategies to create safe spaces for students accessing benefits on campus. Um, so, sorry. So, again, so this is just again uh, reaffirming that uh, we are going to get rid of these misconceptions about people who are experiencing poverty. Um, so, moving on to the slide for creating safe spaces. One of the key ways campuses are addressing hunger is by establishing uh, basic needs centers where students can access various services in one location. Um, these types of centers not only help students access essential services, it also gives them a space to, op to be open about what they're experiencing. Again, talking about hunger, talking about housing insecurity are not easy subjects. And so having a place where students can go to where they feel comfortable and they feel like um, a staff person um, truly understands what they're going through is crucial, is crucial to their um, academic experience. And studies have shown students who have access to benefits have improved, access, uh, who have improved academic uh, success. Uh, so just highlighting some services that are crucial, again, food or SNAP assistance, assistance housing assistance, emergency funds assistance, transportation assistance, and health insurance assistance specifically to mental health services. So how do we develop positive messaging around food benefits? Uh, again, certain language that um, we use in our marketing strategies can sometimes be harmful to our students. For example, the usage of poor, impoverished, impoverished food stamps, or even needy um, can often um, um, be unhelpful to students uh, wanting to access food benefits. So again, we want to just emphasizing using non-stigmatizing slash neutral language like nutritional assistance. And I've also uh, seen campuses use financial aid for food um, in their mar marketing strategies and also holistic student wellness, which is really what we are um, aiming um, our campuses to really um, promote, which is the sense of holistic student wellness. Again, getting the word out is crucial in our student outreach. And so information up, uh, about food resources should be posted on areas like financial aid offices, which uh, many students tend to uh, visit, campus food pantry centers, campus websites, student centers, libraries, um, farmers and farmers markets, and mobile markets, dining halls, and convenience stores. These are essential uh, spaces that students tend to um, uh, surround themselves in, and it's just a great opportunity to outreach to students and let them know what benefits are available to them on their campus. Certain colleges have already established SNAP EBT on their campus, and uh, David will help us understand more on how to do that process. I uh, just wanted to highlight which uh, states have campuses that currently hold SNAP EBT. Um, this is just an example of what UC Davis has done while they have established SNAP EBT on their campus. So you will see a picture of um, them promoting CalFresh, which is a SNAP, um, at their campus retail store, and then uh, the, sig the sign up here with all the food um, um, foods that they can purchase with their benefits. And lastly, I'll just want to post this um, 
this slide up, it says advancing educational equity. And again, the whole aim for this is to reduce stigma around food benefits and help students learn about and enroll in the SNAP program. And again, what we're trying to promote is uh, educational equity, right? And as a student who experienced hunger and housing insecurity on campus, I cannot tell you enough how important it was to have a campus community that was willing to support me as I navigated my experiences and help me um, um, talk about my food insecurity. And ultimately, that allowed me to succeed in my academic um, career. And so next, I will turn it to Dave. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. We can move to the next slide, I believe. Okay, um, so we, we're Humboldt State University. We're in Northern California, and we're part of the 23 campus California State University system. We, on, at this campus, were able to establish EBT approximately four years ago. And when we went through the process, um, there was some interesting lessons learned along the way. But in addition, I've been able to network with other campuses, both within California and throughout the nation, who have questions about um, how to get through and be able to offer SNAP EBT uh, benefits on your campus. So I kind of have a, a, a little bit of a wider perspective rather than just our campus. But I'm mostly speaking from the experience of the process that we went through here at Humboldt State University. So on the slide, it's on the issue of data. So what we were able to do on this campus is use a lot of the data, and I, and I should back up a little bit. I'm on the provider side. So I'm on the uh, executive director for an organization that operates the dining services on our campus, and we are self-operated. So the Moving on to the data, we did have a, a professor in social welfare who was part of a team that was doing uh, research on food insecurity on college campuses. That work was being done, which really proved the, the need within the, the CSU system um, with our students and food insecurity. In addition, the OSNAP program, which I will be mentioning um, quite a bit through this, this talk, was also doing work, and that was an a organization that was born out of the health center on our campus, and particularly uh, through the health ed education program. So what happened for me as the, as the director of this program, I was getting some data and some push from a professor, but also from a direct student uh, services provider area on the campus, and what that did is it really made us prioritize that um, we would be able to prioritize being able to do the EBT program on our campus. I think for the providers out there, there's always, you know, there's always another priority. And so some of the questions that have come up for, with people I've talked to is, the, first of all, the process, but also what's the benefit to your, your program. For us, since we're self-operated, it was just a matter of prioritizing, but it was also a ma matter of being able, even internally, is like, why are we doing this and what, what are the benefits going to be going to be for the organization and for our campus and for our students? So kind of all that is it, it helps to answer the question, why are we doing this and what's the priority? priority? One question that's come up is um, campuses that have outsourced uh, program. So you may be working with an outside provider to provide food on, on your campus. And it's important to have the data for those folks as well, because they're going to ask the question of, you know, why should we prioritize this? What are the benefits? What's the need? Um, next slide. So the mechanics of it are um, as far as getting into the program. So one of the things that questions that comes up quite a bit on all college campuses is how how can we be eligible for the program? And really what it has to do with is the next two bullets um, that I'll, I'll address. They, the, it's a federal program, so the, the guidelines are fairly um, strict in a sense, but they're also fairly straightforward. And for a college campus, one of the stumbling blocks is if for campuses that may have a residential dining program, they may have a food court, 
the way the criteria works, it's a little bit difficult for those types of um, food service areas to get qualified. On our campus, we have seven venues. We qualified one venue. And the reason we chose that venue or were able to, to qualify is that it is uh, essentially a small grocery market in, uh, located in an area that has residential apartments. So people have their own cooking stations in their, in their uh, residential areas. The qualifications are such that you want to be able to prove that you have foodstuffs within the four staple food categories, which are vegetables, fruits, dairy, meat, poultry, fish, bread, or cereals. So again, we essentially have a small grocery market, so we were able to very clearly um, show that we were able to meet the criteria to be able to qualify. Now, there's a few things with that. One is they do do an, outs uh, an inspection of your facility. So when you, if you're filling out the application, you say, yes, we have a dairy case, as an example. Um, they do do an inspection to make sure that you do have the uh, necessary food items on a continuous basis. And so I put that in parentheses because it does actually have that uh, exact language on the um, USDA website. One of the things too is that, and, and Wasini, I don't know if you were able to attach this, but we do have a tip sheet that um, this California State University um, Chancellor's Office and a couple of my colleagues within the system uh, developed that is kind of a uh, guideline on how to get through the process and kind of some of the, the web information that's out there and some of the qu continuous questions that have come up um, over the last few years. Uh, next slide. Once you do get approved by the USDA, it's also um, one of the questions that comes up from the provider side is what does it take to be able to run this program? The uh, accounting and IT does need to be involved, and that's where it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis on how the system's going to work with an individual venue, an individual campus, an individual system. In our case, the, uh, the real difficulty was um, integrating with our uh, point-of-sale system was that we didn't have the ability to do pin-based debit, which is when you're, you know, you're uh, in a grocery market and use your debit card, you have to punch your pin in in order to do the transaction. If you have that capability in your venue, then you're, you're, that's a big part of the battle. Since we didn't have that, we had to work with our uh, POS uh, provider and work out a third-party system to have that keypad available for um, students that are using their EBT card. Other thing is, and I mentioned accounting systems, for us that was relatively easy. One of the uh, perceptions out there from the accounting side that some people, sometimes people ask is that there can be a little bit of a misperception that um, I've heard over the years that people say, oh, I've heard it's really a hassle and it's really hard to get your money. Um, and that, for, at least for us, has really not been true. Once we did the back of house work with our accounting system, it's no different from our perspective um, doing EBT or doing a credit card transaction. So it's basically an automated system. We get the funds transferred automatically, and it's a very, very easy system once it was set up. Um, the next bullet, they provide excellent resources. Part of what happens once you're approved is that they will send you a big packet of information that includes you know, things like posters and, and guide sheets and so forth. They also have very, very good training videos. And for us, that was extremely important because Almost all our cashiers are student employees. So we wanted to be able to um, have good training materials for them. And it's especially important for us because if you, if you, if um, supermarkets will typically have EBT eligible items um, in their point of sale system so that it will allow you to use EBT for certain, per for eligible purchases, but it won't allow you to use EBT for non eligible purchases. So in other words, if you try to you know, buy a pack of cigarettes, it won't allow you to use your EBT card. For us, we chose not to do that for a variety of reasons, doing it as far as at our inventory level. So we did, so what that means is we need to rely on our cashiers to be able to understand 
what the eligibility, what the eligible items are, and to be able to process them appropriately. Um, next slide. Um, one thing I do want to mention, and it dovetails very well with some of the previous information that was that was discussed, is that we we're on the provider side, but we had an incredibly um, strong partner on our campus that really helped on a lot of different levels. Our program on our campus is called OSNAP. So they are um, do peer advocacy training education for all the issues that um, that were mentioned earlier, um, both in terms of food insecurity, but also housing insecurity, access to medical resources, and um, nutrition programs, um, cooking classes, all kinds of things that are trying to address um, food insecurity and access to food. So, so that program was in existence existence when we started this program. What's important is that they were able to get a grant through our county that was that supports SNAP outreach and um, eligibility um, information to be able to essentially help sign students up that are um, potentially eligible for the SNAP EBT benefits. So they do all that work at a student level, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer level, and those students are paid because we have those grant, grant funds. Um, I think that's really important on a lot of levels for us as a provider, then we don't need to, to do that type of outreach. But also, I think it really helps um, having that student-peer-to-peer -peer relationship in terms of education, and it really helps to address the stigma attached that potentially attached around this program. Um, one of the things that we um, have run across going through that application process and understanding what the requirements are is that the 20-hour work requirement around um, eligibility for full-time students is really one of the th one of the uh, areas that's really a roadblock for many, many people. Um, for our campus, it's especially difficult if they're a full-time student to be able to find um, work in our area. We're a relatively small town in a rural area. It's very difficult to find work, period, let alone juggling your schedule to do a full-time student load and also work 20 hours a week. So basically what I'm saying there is that 20 hour a week program is really a problem as far as eligibility. Um, next slide. This is going on to an additional item as far as the, you know, why should we do this? So in our instance, in that one venue, we have a very um, good return as far as the number of people that use their EBT benefits in that venue. Um, as far as our cash sales, they are, it, in total, it's been as much as 10% of our total cash sales. I should mention our program is, um, our food service program, Includes residential dining that they have meal cards that they're able to use in this venue. Cash sales can be a mix of students, non-students, um, community members, etc. We've estimated that as far as the student cash sales, it's, it's been as much as 11 to 12 percent of those of those transactions are EBT transactions. So the return is quite a bit. And from a provider perspective, again, the question might be asked: You know, what's my return on investment? At least for us, it's been a very, very good return as far as the amount of work that we had to do to put into making the system work. Average ticket is $7.50. What that means to me is they're doing small transactions, meals for the day. Um, and what we tell people, too, is that while we do have a small grocery market, our prices are going to be a little bit higher than some of the big supermarkets that are in town. So we really hope that they're doing their main grocery shopping off campus to be able to support themselves. That average ticket price being low helps, says to me that that's exactly what's happening. 40 to 50 transactions a day just in that venue is quite a bit and in my mind. And part of the um, answer to why should we do this too is that I've, I go to that venue quite frequently and I see people using their EBT cards for you know, food for the day. And from an administrative standpoint, you could look at it in dollars and cents, but also when I see those types of transactions happening for our students and they're buying food for the day, I walk away from sometimes 
observing that and having been involved with the setup going, why wouldn't you try to provide this service on the campus so that students can be able to um, receive outside assistance to be able to get through um, their, their college life. Um, so that's basically what I have. The only thing to mention too, again, is that is the tip sheet that um, I mentioned earlier. The other thing is there is another layer to the um, USDA program, which is starting to become um, more popular in California. There's a few campuses that have worked with this area. It's called the Restaurant Meals Program, which provides, um, e you can use your EBT um, benefits for hot meals. Um, and that, I know there's a few campuses that are doing that. We haven't done that because our county has not supported that um, program to this point. It's a county by county eligibility, um, but that is starting to, to happen. And then the other thing is, this is, we look at the EBT program as just one piece of a broader range of services for our students. And we also, from the from our dining services perspective, we also have a fairly robust meal sharing program that is also um, very helpful to our students to be able to access our residential dining um, program, to be able to receive direct assistance, to be able to receive food. Um, this, this was our second year. We're getting um, to the point where we're, I think this year we're very able to disperse well over $12,000 to directly to students. And I think that was my last slide. All right. Thank you all so much to our panelists. Um, we are super excited to have you all here today. Um, and this was such a great webinar. So we're going to move into our question and answer section. So again, if you have any questions to ask, please submit them in the comment box. And we also ask that our guests submitted questions before. Um, so we do have a few questions for our panelists. So the first question is, are there any eligibility differences for community college students? That can Carrie, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. So there are not differentiations between two and four year institutions. But for example, in Massachusetts, um, depending on if the uh, program is certified as a Perkins program, as a career and training program is defined by Perkins, those institutions may have more flexibility to um, qualify students for SNAP than um, an institution in a state that has not taken advantage of that opportunity. Awesome. Um, the next question is, what are the best practices for um, increasing SNAP student enrollment? Dave? Well, in our case, I think the um, really having that student program that I mentioned, the SNAP program out of the health center, has been instrumental on our campus. And I think the, the fact that they have a wide range of services helps that, so they also run the food pantry as an example. Um, the direct student peer-to-peer -peer communication, I think, is, is key. Um, it, it just helps with the application process, it helps with the education process. As I mentioned earlier, it also helps with the you know, potential stigma that might be uh, uh, surrounding this. Um, so I, I really do think having that robust campus partner has really helped us to be able to, to grow this program. Thank you so much. We have another question from Vanessa. So Vanessa stated, when you are trying to sign someone up for SNAP and find that they are ineligible, what is your next step? Hi, this is Carrie. So I will say that, you know, ensuring um, that there is good communication between whoever is either assisting the student with trying to get SNAP or whatever, if the student's communicating with the Human Services Office. Uh, as you could see from my slides, there are a whole bunch of eligibility rules that surround SNAP, and I think the student rules have been established as very confusing. So having a clear understanding of which um, aspect they're being denied for, whether that's income or whether it's 
you know, a student verification and being very clear about if that's an accurate determination, which um, I think is is often difficult to find out. Hopefully the guidelines that we've provided will help with that. And the SNAP and students fact sheet that we've included on the research page goes through sort of like the roadmap of how a student can get SNAP. But I think there really needs to be a clear understanding of what the um, Human Services Office is saying that the student was the reason they were denied and then figuring out if that was accurate or if the student needs to provide more information or you know, some other verification that the, the human services worker did not have at the time they made the determination. Um, there is an appeal process if someone is, is denied and you could always reapply with new information or a change in circumstances. Thank you, Carrie. Another question from Vanessa. Are the student exemptions mentioned at the top of the call on a state-by-state -state basis, or is it a federal exemption? Do students need a local DL ID in order to apply for SNAP? I do not know. Uh, is, that, is that a driver's license ID number? I'm assuming that's what yes, DL ID I is. Yeah, so the rules that I pre um, presented are the federal rules in, in SNAP. Those are the federal student exemptions. And then the couple of examples I provided from the states are where those states are fully leveraging those federal exemptions to the best of their ability to increase students' access to SNAP through those exemptions. And I'm happy to provide more guidance on that um, after the webinar as needed. Another question from Barbara, how do you help students meet their required work hours? So this is Carrie again. Um, what I would say is that um, institutions do have, you know, to the degree that there are student work opportunities or there are work state or federal work study opportunities, institutions could, you know, um, prioritize those students with the highest need for those so they could meet their SNAP eligibility requirement. And as I said previously, you know, states have the opportunity to um, choose to average those work hours across a month or a semester and um, engaging with your state human services offices and encouraging them to do that could also improve student access. Job. Yeah, I was able to, um, I didn't get to see the whole thing yet, but I did see her testimony and her answer to one question. <laughs> <laughs> How was your trip? Uh, it was good. It went really well. Good. Thank you. Somebody has their audio on. If they could place themselves on mute, that would be great. Also, next question from Barbara. What colleges, universities in Ohio can students use their SNAP benefits on campus? I'm sorry, can so, you repeat that question? What colleges, universities in Ohio can students use their SNAP benefits on campus? So there are no restrictions on which type of institution um, establishes EBT on their campus. Again, EBT usage is, is used by um, just regular bodegas or like uh, markets. So there's nothing really different in terms of like uh, the opportunity to become an EBT retailer. It's just more so going through the process might be a little bit more unique for college um, campuses. But essentially each campus or retailer has opportunity to apply for EBT. If there are no more questions, we will go on ahead and conclude this webinar. Um, on this resource page, there are the SNAP and, SNAP and student fact sheets, um, also an EBT guidebook, um, tips for establishing EBT on your campus, and then also a family-friendly campus toolkit. And also, if you have any further questions, you will be able to reach out to each of our panelists by their email, and we will be sending out a recording of this webinar out after this. So thank you all for joining us.